morning and uh, welcome to everyone. This is the second meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee in the fifth session of Parliament. Uh, may I in particular welcome the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister who are with us today. Now, perhaps the others present could introduce themselves. I'm Simon Fuller. I'm Deputy Director in the Office of Chief Economist. I'm Rachel Guion. I'm Deputy Director, Enterprise and Skills Review. I'm Andy Hogg. I'm from the Scottish Government's oil and gas team. Uh, and perhaps I should say, of course, the, the Cabinet Secretary is uh, Keith Brown and the Minister for Business, Innovation and Energy is Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, my apologies, of course, you, you do have names as well as the positions that you, you hold and for which you're here. Um, I understand that uh, both of you are able to give us a brief uh, summary, as it were, of your position prior to moving into the evidence session. So perhaps I could ask, first of all, Keith Brown, the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, to speak to the committee. Hey, thank you, convener, and thank you for the opportunity to come along this morning. And also, congratulations to yourself on the position of uh, convenership of this committee and to the other members who've been appointed. Um, in the role that I have now as Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, uh, I'm looking forward to working with the committee and individual members. And if I can, as you've suggested, convener, I'll take the opportunity to set out some of the key issues which uh, I'll be focusing on over the coming months as part of the government's approach to making Scotland a more productive uh, country through innovation, investment, internationalisation and, of course, inclusive growth. Uh, you know, clearly, the economic climate for Scotland, the UK and Europe as a whole has obviously changed uh, in the last few days as a result of the EU referendum outcome, and this will inevitably lead to a period of economic uncertainty. And it means, of course, that the external headwinds, uh, whether you think about the low oil price or uh, lowering demand in China and elsewhere, uh, they'll be added to and they will persist right through 2016 and beyond. So I, for my part, have been engaging extensively with the business community in Scotland over recent days uh, to emphasise the point, perhaps the obvious point, but worth emphasising that as of now we are still firmly in the EU. Uh, trade and business should continue as normal and we're determined that Scotland will continue now in the future uh, to be an attractive and a stable place to do business. And I think maintaining and strengthening our links with our key European markets will be a key priority in the weeks and months to come. Having said all that, I think there is a, a real a, and underlying um, strength in Scotland's economy. Last year, the economy grew nearly 2% in the face of some of the most challenging external economic conditions uh, that we've seen for some time. We do have a highly skilled workforce, and I don't, of course, underestimate uh, the challenge of improving the skill set that we have uh, in Scotland. Uh, but we have been very successful also at attracting overseas investment and we have strengths across a range of sectors so we intend to approach the coming challenges from a position of some strength uh, and we also of course have to not lose sight of the fact that there are a number of other key areas of work which are currently in train now chief amongst those of course is the work that we're doing in the northeast of scotland uh, of course that's been particularly impacted by the pressures facing the oil and gas sector and in particular the oil price uh, the Scottish Government is working very closely with the oil and gas industry work, uh, that includes the workforce, the trade unions and the UK Government, to secure a long-term future for the sector through the Energy Jobs Task Force and through the £12 million Transition Training Fund, which is there to support individuals and to help the sector retain talent. Uh, we're also continuing, for our part, to press the UK Government to take further action uh, to support the industry. Uh, you will be aware of the UK Government's statement at the budget about various measures, one of which was um, an indication that they would be considering long, long, um, loan guarantees rather for infrastructure projects. And on that particular issue, we have um, a, encouraged the UK Government to move very quickly because the discussions that myself and Paul Wheelhouse had with the industry, that was number one in terms of their asks. And I'll be meeting with the... Um, Chief Secretary to the Treasury and with other Ministers uh, in the next week or so and intend to reinforce that point. 
Uh, we're also working to support the North East region more widely through the £125 million that we contributed to the Aberdeen City Region deal uh, and a further £254 million of support for key infrastructure in Aberdeen. Uh, and it's our view that these investments will help to enhance and promote the city's position as one of the world's leading locations for business and industry. Uh, another key priority for me is the review of our enterprise development and skills agencies and it's obviously the case that these agencies play a key role in the delivery of services to support Scotland's businesses, the colleges, universities and the workforce. Uh, so that review offers the opportunity to build on the achievements of all these bodies to ensure that they continue to be best placed to deliver our shared ambitions on Scotland's productivity performance. And the review will focus on three particular aims. Um, first of all, achieving the government's ambitions as set out in the Economic Strategy and National Performance Framework. Uh, ensuring our economic and skills interventions are shaped by the actual needs of users and the economy. And ensuring that delivery continuously reflects best practice. So just to conclude, really, uh, if I could, Convener, the fundamentals of the Scottish economy are strong. We do not downplay the challenges, either those which are facing us externally or those further actions that we have to take to make sure that we are um, best placed to maximise uh, econ uh, economic prosperity in Scotland. We do have high levels of employment, which is not, of course, to deny the levels of unemployment that we have. Uh, we have one of the most highly skilled workforces in Europe. We have a strong business base across a range of sectors, and we are an attractive uh, country for foreign direct investment. So uh, on those points, I do uh, reiterate that I would look forward to working with yourself, Convener, and with MSPs uh, in the committee and across the chamber to further develop the strengths of Scotland's economy and to tackle the ongoing challenges that it faces. And to repeat something which is said almost routinely at the start of Parliament, and has certainly mentioned a number of times at the start of this Parliament, uh, I genuinely do uh, have an interest in finding out what the views or suggestions of other uh, members uh, are. And from my part, I've met with, uh, I think, two of the opposition uh, speaks, uh, spokespersons already, and I hope to meet with the others uh, very shortly. And that's a genuine invitation for constructive ideas that we will look into and take on board if we're able to support them. Thank you. Thank you very much, and also my congratulations on your appointment to that position. We will now hear from Paul Wheelhouse, who's the Minister for Business, Innovation and Energy, and my congratulations to you on your appointment. Thank you. I understand that you need to leave by 12 noon, so uh, thank you for indicating that to the committee, and when that stage comes, you can uh, simply leave. Th thank you. With no yeah. further ado, if that's all right. right. I so appreciate, appreciate your forbearance on that. I, I don't have a formal statement, but if I, if I may, just, just a, a, few, a few things at the outset. Certainly reiterate the Cabinet Secretary's remarks. I very much look, for, look forward to working and engaging with the committee and the important work you do. It's an unsung part of the Parliament's uh, uh, activities, committee work, and I congratulate you, uh, convener, on your appointment as well, indeed all members of the committee, because I know it is a vitally important committee. Um, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, much of the engagement we've had so far has been with the oil and gas sector to try and deal with uh, the current difficulties that the sector has faced. Um, I've also been engaging very positively with the renewables uh, sector, including last week attending the offshore wind, en wind energy conference in Manchester uh, to put forward Scotland's um, pitch, if you like, to be a, a sound location for further investment in offshore wind in, in our country. Uh, I'm delighted to say there are some positive messages that are uh, coming forward around the um, current activity in that sector and also potentially future activities. Uh, and uh, we have had good news, obviously, in the form of the Beatrice uh, offshore wind uh, site being uh, brought to financial close and work being commissioned from Scottish yards and facilities. I'm also responsible for areas like innovation and uh, with the Cabinet Secretary had very positive engagement with the Can Do Innovation Forum and in the course of my duties I'm also be responsible for uh, areas such as the pace response to uh, difficulties that companies face uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and I know a number of members on the committee are also, uh, have, including Mr. Mr Leonard has an interest in a particular, particular company in that respect. Uh, as the Cabinet Secretary has outlined, we've also got a key role in terms of some of the industry leadership groups and uh, I have in the weeks since my appointment been involved with attending meetings of the Financial Services uh, and Life Sciences uh, ILGs and uh, indeed engaging with retailers, but it's a broad portfolio. I'm really excited to be part of it and I'm looking forward to working with the committee uh, as we take that work forward, but I'll leave it at that uh, convener because I appreciate we've got limited time. Uh, thank you very much, Minister.
Now, the members of the committee have a, a few questions which they would like to put to the, both yourself and uh, the Cabinet Secretary, and the other uh, individuals who have introduced themselves may wish to come in on one or two points as they feel appropriate. So I'll, I'll start, first of all, by asking uh, myself a question. We have had uh, considerable foreign inward investment into Scotland and, of course, the internationalisation of the economy in Scotland is a factor that we've seen playing out in a different number of areas over the past few years and decade, indeed. Does the Cabinet Secretary consider that the internationalisation has both positive and negative consequences, and what is the Scottish Government looking to do, and any specific examples, if the Cabinet Secretary has any, to seek to both make the most of internationalisation, how it can positively assist the Scottish economy, and how any of the potential negatives can be dealt with? Um, I think they're overwhelmingly positive um, international investment into Scotland. Um, the other aspect of internationalisation, of course, is how we can grow our exports and be more international in the outlook that we have in our domestic uh, economy. And the two things are obviously linked. When we have, I think it's 119 different um, uh, projects uh, of investment uh, coming into Scotland, which is... Uh, Truly remarkable, given that the only area to have had more than that was the uh, it was London within the UK. When you have that coming in, you can often get not always, but you can often get new practices and new innovation coming in with that investment. And I think that's got to be positive for the the Scottish economy. I think perhaps in your mind, convener, in terms of uh, disadvantages, would be uh, the fear that's been there for some time that sometimes this sometimes this investment can be footloose. Um, it can use up um, grants and it can move on elsewhere. And of course that's something that we're very concerned to make sure uh, is not the case. Um, but I think it is uh, extremely positive. That's why you've been quite um, determined in going out after that investment. A great deal of work is done by SDI and by Scottish Enterprise to attract that investment. Um, obviously, we want it to have um, a beneficial impact on the economy, not least, first of all, because of the uh, creation of jobs, which often follows. Uh, but we obviously want to make sure that it's the kind of investment that fits with where Scotland um, wants to go. So I think we have a very good track record on that. I do think that very recent events will challenge us in relation to that, will challenge the whole of the UK in relation to that. I don't think, for example, the downgrading of the credit rating is... Uh, at all helpful. Um, but I think, it, as is the case with the general economic conditions, whether that's the tailing off or the, the slowing of demand uh, across the world, certainly from China and elsewhere, whether it's because of other pressures, you know, Iran, Russia, and so on, in relation to the oil price um, oversupply um, and tailing, uh, tailing off of demand, we can't really change that. What we have to do is try and work in the environment that we find ourselves in. The same is true of trying to attract uh, investment. So we'll continue to do that. Um, and as I say, the success that we've got, I was talking to Ernst and Young last year, I think the Conservative um, uh, MSP, Murdo Fraser, has asked a question about what the value of that uh, investment is, those 119 projects. And I've asked, as well as our own um, uh, people in Scottish Government, have asked Ernst and Young about work on that as well. So I hope to come back to uh, either this committee or the Parliament with that information to give more of a, um, to go to the heart of your question, the exact value that we can attach um, to that investment. But I think it is almost with the exception beneficial to the economy. Can I certainly, up? yes. Um, certainly, to, to just to emphasise what the, the Cabinet Secretary has said, I, I'm certainly aware from just having attended an event uh, this morning actually at BlackRock, it's a UKTI-sponsored uh, event to look at the um, collective pitch on financial services that we're making sort of internationally, and uh, Lord Dunlop for UK Government was there as, as well, and uh, it was very clear from those in the industry that they see the location at the Edinburgh is, uh, for example, the uh, second largest financial centre um, uh, after London. In, in a European context, we have a, a hugely significant role, and one of the reasons why 
you know, this is in respect to the internationalisation aspect of why we are successful and will continue, hopefully, to be successful, is because of the the quality of the, the skills we have available, the track record, the, the heritage, if you like, in financial services. It's not the be all and end all, but it is important. But we also have locational advantages, being um, uh, in a in a time zone uh, which is very convenient from the point of view of trading, uh, both uh, in the sort of Atlantic context and also to the east. So we've got a geographically kind of uh, advantageous position. Uh, English language being a language which is obviously used extensively in the financial service industry. So there are some natural advantages we have that we can play upon, but we also uh, have had some successes in sectors which are perhaps not so obvious. And I know in my own patch down the borders just last week, there were uh, 30 manufacturing jobs reshored by Starts, an American uh, owned company into the borders to to put them back in jobs that had been lost to to Scotland and the work of STI and uh, the local council as well, but also um, Scottish Enterprise to re-secure jobs coming back in is also a positive trend to see as well. Manufacturing coming back uh, to Scotland and hopefully back to to UK as well, and that's something that we can obviously try and learn lessons from. What was the what were the successful factors, and what's clear in terms of the pitch on financial services and other industries is making a uh, pitch not just about those things like language and location advantage but also the quality of life we can offer the quality of public services uh, while our infrastructure is is not perfect i don't think anyone would say it is it is improving greatly and uh, our broadband co communications and so forth so we are modernizing as a country as well and we need to exploit those opportunities to try and attract uh, inward investment to scotland to try and um, uh, if you like, uh, offset a previous trend where perhaps jobs are being offshore to other environments, we're increasingly being competitive and seeing jobs being brought back uh, to, to Scotland and to UK. All right, thank you very much. Um, Ash Denham. I'm interested in the government's work on promoting innovation. Um, in the paper that we received for this meeting, it was suggesting that there were challenges facing Scotland in terms of research and development and business expenditure on that was quite low compared to other countries. So how can the Scottish Government encourage businesses to invest in R&D? Yeah, um, certainly we are doing um, some what I believe is, is uh, leading edge of uh, work through Can Do Innovation Forum, which the Deputy First Minister in his previous role uh, drove forward and the Cabinet Secretary and myself uh, attended the, the most recent meeting of the Can Do Forum. We heard about pilot projects which are being taken forward uh, at, at a Scotland level, um, two, two examples of which, one which is in the area of, sort of digital services, which is um, looking at trying to um, identify and uh, support and fast track um, new digital services companies. They tend to either be winners very quickly or, they, or they're not. It's the nature of the industry. And so we need to get in, get interventions in there to make sure they've got the right support. And that's a, a very exciting pilot that will help drive forward potentially uh, areas for innovation in what could be a hugely successful sector for Scotland. We've got a tremendous record in the games industry and other aspects of um, uh, digital technology. Uh, we, we know that through the, the work of the financial services industry, uh, fintech is another area of financial technology, uh, which is a hugely important area for financial services. And Scotland, because of our heritage and in, in being innovators in financial services, whether it's uh, Stuart Stevenson will remind you, I can promise, uh, in the course of committee debates, uh, the invention, invention of the AT largely happened in Scotland. Um, these, are, these are areas where we have been at the forefront of a particularly important industry internationally, and so we have a heritage there we can exploit. And, but on the other extent, um, in public services, we've got opportunities to innovate as well, and obviously the public sector is a very significant part of our economy, and therefore the pilot that's being taken forward in the Highlands area to look at innovation in and around uh, healthcare is, is also a potentially very exciting one as well. So we've got examples of, we're trying to take forward uh, our approach uh, at a kind of sectoral level, if you like, looking at how we help uh, small, medium-sized enterprises, although I think there's some debate about whether they should be called SMEs and digital, digital sector, um, different terminology would be used, but take forward how we can support individual companies and sectors as a whole. And then on, on top of that, um, the, the work we are doing more generally uh, in terms of the manufacturing uh, action plan that we've developed to try and ensure that we have uh, the ability to support the manufacturing sector in Scotland to innovate and some very interesting ideas coming forward about creating a centre of excellence for, for the manufacturing sector as well to, to try and support uh, the needs of manufacturers and give them access to perhaps um, 
equipment and technology, which would present a very high barrier to entry if you were trying to um, explore new product development, uh, to be able to access that in a, in a, a facility which is shared, and to be able to um, uh, develop new uh, prototypes and, and those kind of areas as well. So there's a range of different measures to support to individual companies through to infra creating infrastructure that will support innovation, such as a, a manufacturing centre of excellence or something of that nature. Uh, and so we're taking forward a range of, range of ideas in that area. Can I just mention, in addition to that, that um, R&D is a very clear correlation between R&D and successful economies. If you look at um, you know, the US does more in R&D than the UK does, it's more successful. Japan is the same. Um, the EU does more than the UK does. Um, and I think it's really important that we encourage that. It's not just about what the government does, either through um, the funding council or through its higher and further education institutions, which is very important. It's also what individual businesses do, and that culture of R&D. And I've mentioned in the chamber previously one example, Scott and Fife, in Fife, who, facing very difficult circumstances, took on additional design capacity, uh, almost completely revamped their product range and turned around their business um, because of that. And that's investment in essentially in R&D. I think it's worth saying, though, that we do have um, a, a successful tracker that's risen by 44% in real terms between 2007 uh, and 2014. That's from £629 million to £905 million. And that 44% increase in Scotland compares to a 10% increase in the UK. So I think we are making progress, but I think it's also true to say that we've got a long way to go to reach the levels of the, the EU and uh, world leaders like Japan, and it's a very clear correlation between R&D and economic success. Thank you. i move on then to Liam Kerr. So I, I'm going to ask you about the oil and gas sector. I, the, you talked about engaging with the oil and gas sector, and uh, you outlined some of the steps you've been taking so that 12 million transition fund, uh, which is obviously very good, but it, my understanding is it's very difficult to access, uh, and there hasn't been a great take-up. Uh, you talked of the 254 million contribution, but I understand there's no fixed time scale on that, so we're not quite sure when it will come up. And you talked about pressing the UK government to support the industry, which good. Uh, but my questions arising from that are, what is the Scottish government doing to support the sector? And maintain the jobs up up in the northeast. Uh, what is it doing to support those who've lost their jobs, to uh, with the transition training fund to to reskill and uh, remain in Scotland and remain in the northeast? Uh, and just finally, uh, you'll know there's this Aberdeen master plan that's uh, being looked at at the moment. Now, obviously, that will have a significant positive impact on the local economy up there. Uh, so, are there any plans? for further investment into that by the Scottish Government going forward? I can just take, uh, first of all, your point about the £254 million in investment. I think it's really important to be clear about this. I think you, you'd said that there was no timetable for it or timescale. Just to repeat how this came about, we were entering into a conversation with Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire Councils and the UK Government on the City Deal. Uh, we thought that the city deal should be far more expansive than was proposed by the UK government. They proposed £125 million from them, £125 million from the Scottish government over a number of different things, the oil and gas the innovation centre, um, in relation to digital, uh, in relation to some infrastructure works. Because they refused to go any further than that, we announced a further £254 million. Now, the city deal itself is over a 10-year period. So that was the context for the announcement of that £254 million, which covered, for example, work on the Montrose, the Usain uh, Junction, uh, and also other uh, initiatives in relation to housing and in relation to putting more money into digital. So what we did was we went further. So if you put that together, you come up with like £504 million, over half a billion pounds, three quarters of which has been funded by the Scottish Government. So that's how it came about, and that's what the timescale is. The timescale is exactly as the same as the timescale for the city deal. That was the context for the announcement. But it doesn't mean to say, for example, in relation to the Lawrence Kirk Junction, which is one of the proposals, that it will take 10 years to do that. But you cannot be definitive about it, because any project like that, anybody that knows anything about it knows you have to go through statutory processes, which may or may not include a public inquiry, so you cannot be definitive. And we want to get on with doing that project. So I think that's a very substantial contribution, far more than the UK government was willing to put in uh, to the North East economy. And 
That is, of course, in addition to the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, for which people have been campaigning for nearly 50 years, um, and it's now being done. People can see the evidence uh, on the ground in relation to that. So I think we've done a great deal uh, in relation to that. Um, of course, we have the full uh, range of uh, government bodies trying to help with people who will be looking for either new jobs uh, or to retrain. And uh, my colleague, uh, Paul uh, Wheelhouse, who's responsible for energy, can mention some, uh, some more about that. But the Transition Training Fund has helped many people, uh, not all of whom necessarily going on to a new job, some of whom uh, will do that, but who are looking for advice and support in relation to their skills. And the, the point of the Transition Training Fund, which was welcomed, I think, by uh, all, all concerned at the time, is to try and retain, uh, try and help people uh, stay in gainful employment. Of course it is, but PACE is also doing that, and there have been three PACE events in addition to that. But it's also to try and make sure that we retain, first of all, the skills in that area, or that we retain the skills in the industry. You'll know yourself how mobile that industry is. So it's quite possible people can move elsewhere, but they'll have the option to come back uh, when uh, things uh, further improve. So. That's the basis on which we've tried to help uh, people uh, in the North East. I think it's a very uh, taken with the city deal and the additional extra investment that we um, announced, a very good package. And the point of that is we had the Secretary of State for Transport come up, I don't know, about a year ago and say that the problem in Scotland was there, there hadn't been enough investment in the transport infrastructure for decades. That's what he said. He actually was a transport minister in 1989, but never mind. Uh, he was right in that. Why we don't have, for example, all our cities connected by motorway or dual carriageway is an important point. But if you look at what the people in the North East have said, for long enough there's not been that development in the infrastructure, the AWPR perhaps being the perhaps being the crucial point. To, there's another much smaller project called, a project called the, the Mustorlock Bypass. It's a very small uh, development, but a bypass, again, people in Murray have been campaigning for that for 50 years. It's now been completed and is open. So we've understood the bottlenecks which are there in terms of the infrastructure, and I think our track record in trying to tackle that, not least given the constraints we have in our capital and other budgets, has been commendable. But perhaps my colleague want to say a bit more about the uh, oil side of things as well. Uh, thank you. Um, certainly just to, to add to what the Cabinet Secretary has said, clearly as, as the Cabinet Secretary says, we're, we're using all the powers we have under devolved powers to try and support the, support the industry at this difficult time. Um, job losses in the industry continue to remain a significant cause for concern and uh, a key aim of the Energy Jobs Task Force that's been referred to has been to reach and support those at risk of redundancy. So the, the, the position as at um, before last week's event on the 22nd of 22nd of June at Robert Gordon University, which we don't yet have statistics for attendance uh, for yet, but the industry, the industry task force has engaged with approximately 8,800 individuals and over 100 employers to date um, to better help them, uh, those who are affected, move forward into new employment. As the Cabinet Secretary said, the Transition Training Fund, we recognise there have been some uh, sort of teething troubles. Uh, the previous Minister, Fergus Ewing, had changed the, the criteria in ref reflection of that uh, to no longer make it a requirement for someone to have identified uh, employment before getting access to the Transition Training Fund. So that will hopefully help some individuals um, who know perhaps that there is a need for skills but not yet identified a, a specific employment opportunity um, that will allow them to exercise those skills, to gain the training, to be allowed to transition into new uh, opportunities. And indeed, at the, uh, the offshore wind energy uh, conference I, I referred to earlier on um, in, in Manchester last week, discussed this issue with a number of offshore wind uh, employers who are looking at potentially transitioning individuals from uh, oil and gas sector. In some cases, because they have, uh, they are an oil oil and gas uh, developer uh, or, or operator and have a renewable subsidiary in other cases because they are um, uh, looking at opportunities to take people with, with subsea skills in those kind of areas that they'll need for offshore installation. So there is ongoing work um, being supported by the Transition Training Fund to make sure those individuals do have the transitional skills they need to get into these training opportunities, uh, their employment opportunities and also um, to try and work with um, uh, associated sectors like renewable energy to try and make sure that there are um, opportunities to take them on. We do have a challenging environment in those sectors that could potentially absorb skills from oil and gas and that we have a destabilised environment in terms of financial support to the renewables industry at the moment, and that is creating uncertainty in that industry. Uh, in an ideal world, we would have a more propitious uh, set of circumstances in which to recruit people into offshore wind and other renewables opportunities. But having said that, there are still opportunities arising, and so we'll do what we can to make sure uh, that those are taken up uh, as best as possible with employees coming out of the North, North Sea sector. Um, 
I believe that there has been uh, some interest in the past of the, the, the work that has um, uh, been taken forward uh, by the uh, oil and gas uh, uh, sort of the energy uh, jobs task force. I'm happy to, to try and provide some more detail for the committee if that would be of interest in due course. Thank you. Uh, Jackie Bailey. Um, in the interest of time, I only require a response from either the Cabinet Secretary or the Minister, because um, we really have um, pressure on, on the time available to us. Obviously, the impact of leaving the European Union um, is not yet quantified, but already I think we're all hearing anecdotal stories about you know, investment decisions being changed, jobs maybe being withdrawn, um, you know, and that's not the situation we, we would want. So what are you doing initially? Um, about that and specifically you have already an economic strategy but you know people want it implemented so where is the action plan are we going to see one coming where is um, the detailed performance measures and targets um, because that might be part of the solution hey, I'm happy to answer that for Jackie Bailey of course that uh, the vote last week and the implications of it changes um, quite a lot within the economic landscape um, there's no question of that. Uh, and I do think it is a case of making sure that we position Scotland, first of all, to take advantage of any investment opportunities. For example, in the oil industry, which we've just been talking about, there is uh, something of a, an uptick in terms of the fact that they pay in uh, dollars and not in pounds, and there's a benefit uh, to that. Um, there's also the case that we've, for example, you ask what action we're taking. I've spoken to, I think, nearly all the uh, major banks and a number of the substantial businesses over the course of the last three or four days to find out exactly what they uh, would need from the government in terms of any interest that they have to also provide reassurance to them as large employers of people from uh, the rest of the EU uh, about the approach of the Scottish government, the assurances which the First Minister has given to them, the fact that we remain currently within the EU, that it's our intention to stay in the EU and to provide as much reassurance as possible. And we've put at the disposal of those companies and we'll have ongoing, uh, we've created new fora for ongoing discussions with these companies as things move forward to provide that level of reassurance. We will obviously want to be much more acutely aware uh, or as acutely aware as we can be of any potential threat of any disinvestments uh, as we are, as always, of any potential opportunities for new investments. So we've had that discussion uh, with uh, uh, those companies, and I think that's been very beneficial. They seem to have been very grateful for the uh, immediate contact that they've had from the Scottish Government and that level of support. So, yes, uh, if at the roots of uh, Jackie Bailey's question is the extent to which the events of the last few days change things in terms of how we approach the working economy, then, of course, uh, they do. We have to have a different emphasis. We had in place contingency plans uh, before the referendum uh, in this eventuality, and we will see those things through. Um, just briefly, comment, uh, just well, one, one thing. I appreciate the, the point. Um, well, sorry. Sorry, I, I do want to pursue one of you, because I do think it takes time when both of you answer. Um, can uh, Jackie Bailey. Perhaps we could um, allow Jackie Bailey to um, do this because we have a very limited time slot and I would like to allow each member of the committee to put at least one question. Um, thank you, Convener. I will be very brief. Um, I'm struggling to understand your first point, which is somehow if a company is paid in dollars, this is a, a, a good thing. Um, if you've studied the price of the, the pound relative to the dollar, you will understand that companies paid in dollars are suffering an immediate loss. So, you know, I don't understand where you're coming from on that one. So that's the first thing. Second thing is I asked you specifically about the economic strategy. When's the action plan coming? When's the comprehensive measurement framework? And I don't think I heard a response. Yeah, I, I think I have both responded to that latter point in the chamber previously and have mentioned things like, the, and as has been mentioned already, the, the manufacturing strategy that we have, the different elements that we're putting in place in terms of productivity, in terms of the infrastructure. The point I was making in terms of dollars is that the price of oil is traded in dollars. That's the point I'm making. And that's why there's, uh, some people have said there's been a, a, an uptick for them in relation to that. And perhaps one of the officials, uh, despite the fact that um, you're not too keen to hear from other people. It may be that one of the officials wants to comment on that, but that is the point I'm making about the, the oil industry. Uh, but we have, and I've mentioned before in the chamber, the different aspects of the economic strategy. The point I was trying to make in responding to your first question is, of course, we have to look afresh at how we do that because of recent events. But I think it would be useful to hear from uh, Simon as well. So on the, um, I think the, the oil price point, which I think was being made, was that the, um, for companies operating in the North Sea, when they sell their oil, the oil is priced 
in dollars. And then obviously when they take that money back to the UK, they're in effect repatriating that money and putting it back into pounds. So for a company which is primarily operating in sterling in terms of its costs, labour costs and such like, but is able to export its products and sell the products it's exporting in dollars, the exchange rate movements we've seen in the past few days will provide essentially a fill-up for those companies when they're taking that money back into the UK. The problem with some existing companies, sorry, convener, I'll be very quick, is you know one is being paid in dollars that has contacted me this week to say they're suffering an immediate loss because of that self-same exchange rate mechanism. So there are swings and roundabouts here. Thank you. It depend on the company. Um, Andy Whiteman. Yes, thank you, convener. <clears throat> A couple of very quick questions. First to the Cabinet Secretary, what is your definition of sustainable economic growth? Uh, well, I think for a fuller explanation, you can look at the government statement, its economic strategy, but it's obviously growth which is sustainable. It's sustainable in terms of the economy, sustainable in terms of the environment, and it's sustainable in terms of the human resources. So if you look at things like fair work practices, it's not, in my view, sustainable to have work practices which are so punitive in terms of employees that you don't get the full benefit of the employees, or it has such a detrimental impact on the workforce that you don't get the full potential. The same would apply in relation to the environment as well. You want to have um, an economy which uses the environment, works with the environment in a way that is sustainable. I don't think that the definition of sustainable um, is, uh, is that challenging. I think it's fairly obvious if you can get something which sustains itself over a period of time rather than which burns itself out, whether it's in terms of the economy uh, or the workforce or in terms of investment, then you have something which is sustainable. Okay. And very briefly on, um, on energy. Um, the government's got a target of two gigawatts of community and locally sourced uh, owned rather renewables by 2030 with the cuts in feed-in tariffs etc and the your intention to produce an energy strategy what plans are you take are you, you what plans do you have to ensure that a that targets met but possibly exceeded given that it's potentially more resilient part of the uh, renewable energy uh, sector well, in, indeed, I mean, I, I, I'm glad that point has been raised. I think um, clearly we have a number of different reasons for supporting community energy, not least because the benefits from delivering the, uh, the, the energy itself can be felt at a local level. The local community will gain uh, from the uh, profitability of, of the scheme. Uh, Mr Whiteman is quite right. The changes in uh, financial subsidies which have been implemented by UK government and obviously the, the Scottish government no longer has, and the Scottish Parliament has no longer has powers to legislate in areas such as rocks um, as a result of decision that was taken uh, in the House of Lords. Um, we are in a position where we have to try and influence through other means in terms of the overarching energy strategy which we will be developing over the course of this calendar year and hopefully have uh, published by, by the end of the year. Um, working in parallel with the second the third sorry version of the report and proposals and policies which is the government's climate change strategy so the, these two documents are interlinked uh, obviously energy is going to be critical to delivery on our climate change ambitions uh, but also uh, we are seeing a change in our, our stance on on energy trying to encourage more local and community uh, projects we are confident that we are uh, well on our, well on our way to achieving the, the two gigawatt target, but it is becoming more challenging, and I certainly acknowledge that. So we'll have to try and look at all the different, developing the energy strategy, all the different interventions we can bring to bear to support uh, development of community projects. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the early phases of my, my new role to try and look at the opportunities in relation to uh, community hydro level uh, projects, which have taken a bit of a hammering because of the changes in feed-in tariffs and the digression uh, 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 and its impact on uh, on hydro projects and creating uncertainty for investors and to identify other opportunities to resurrect some of those projects. So I'm open uh, to contributions from, as, as the Cabinet Secretary is, from, from around the table and uh, constructive ideas from Mr Whiteman and others as to how we can achieve that. So it'll be an open door. I'm happy to meet Mr Whiteman to, to see if there are any thoughts that he and the Green Party have in that area. And more generally as well, of course, we've uh, set out in the manifesto uh, plans for creating an uh, energy, energy company as well, which would be hopefully an area of policy that uh, members will take an interest in. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's in relation to Beatrix, uh, the ministers, and I wondered if the government's assessing the impact on businesses here in Scotland with, in relation to the downgrading of the UK uh, 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 pound and 
uh, if there's any, in, for people who are investing right at the moment in court, right in the middle of the cycle, is there any, any assistance that can be given? And are we talking to the UK government in relation to, I know that the, the, the Bank of England, England is actually uh, putting money in at the present time, but is there any, is there any uh, departments in Scotland looking at assisting uh, uh, businesses right now who are caught uh, in this cycle? Yeah, I think I would uh, just um, suggest in relation to Mr Patterson's question that what we said at the start uh, in terms of the engagement we've had with businesses is a kind of rolling programme. So in addition to the uh, conversations which I had over the last few days, uh, Paul Wheelhouse has also had with a number of the, uh, the sectors uh, as well. So it's trying to, we have, of course, many um, processes by which we can stay in touch with business. And one of the organisations I was speaking to was the Chambers of Commerce over the weekend as well. So we do have tho that, those conduits through which we can find out if there's particular pressures for either particular sectors or particular businesses. And uh, the way that I've spoken with businesses to say, let us know, you know, you, you're the ones that know your business. If you feel there's pressures, um, if there's something we can help out with, that we'll do that. And so far, uh, the businesses I've spoken to have said that they're grateful for that uh, contact and they will use it if they feel they need to. In relation to discussions with the UK government, and um, you mentioned the Governor of the Bank of England, the First Minister spoke on Friday morning with the Governor of the Bank of England, and I was uh, party to that call, and that's when he gave the assurances uh, in relation to uh, the markets and the money which the UK government had on standby to use to support the markets. Um, so we've had that reassurance, we've had that conversation. There's also to be further meetings with the um, uh, First Minister and the Gover Governor of the Bank of England uh, in relation to that. And the third point to the question was, relationships and discussions with the UK government. Um, I think it's four, maybe five UK ministers that I'll be meeting over the course of the next 10 days. And I think that uh, level of engagement is reflected amongst my colleagues as well. There are obviously major issues that we want to try and get. I mean, some of these meetings were sent up for different purposes, but will now also include uh, discussions around the impact of Brexit as well. So that conversation uh, is happening um, and it will be right across government that we'll see that. Um, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Convener, and thank you to the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister for taking time out uh, to meet with us today. Um, given uh, the uncertainty over the EU referendum, and there's no doubt there will be significant um, uncertainty arising from that, um, we discussed this beforehand. We're keen that this committee looks at and continues not to be distracted or be distracted by the, the, the EU referendum because I think there are key uh, underlying issues uh, that we can still address because Scottish exports to the EU, um, I think, only account for 15% of our exports, while exports uh, for to the rest of uh, the UK account for something like 60% of our exports. So we're very keen, while the EU question is important, but we, we continue the business of this committee without, without distraction. So I have, given this is our first meeting, I have a more general question uh, for, for the Cabinet Secretary about the structure of the Scottish economy. In each of the last seven years, the Scottish economy has underperformed the rest of the UK in terms of GDP growth uh, and is currently underperforming uh, Wales and Ireland. And this, this seven-year period includes a time when oil was above $110 a barrel, so it's not just a case or a question about oil and gas. I would like to get your views on uh, what the structural issues we face as an economy are, because we are, given the skills as I said we have as a country, we should be performing better, I think, in terms of GDP growth. I don't at this stage uh, venture to offer answers, but I think we should be looking at productivity, uh, the skills gap, unemployment's at 6.2%, but we have a significant skills gap in the economy. Uh, we have a lack of funding or resources for new innovations and new businesses starting up. And the public sector in Scotland is far larger, as a proportion of GDP, is far larger than elsewhere in the UK. So while I'm not asking for uh, all the questions now, given this is our first meeting, I would like your initial thoughts as to the priorities both in terms of your policy and our uh, committee remit, what the priorities are in terms of redressing this structural, what seems to be a structural issue with the Scottish economy that we are continuing to underperform the rest of the UK? It's hey, a very good question. I would say that um, 
Perhaps I could uh, write back to the member in relation to the point he makes about GDP and also a more historical perspective. It seems for the best part of my adult life that has been the case, that Scotland has been substantially behind uh, the rest of the UK in a number of different indicators. Uh, there are a number of indicators in the last seven years where we're well ahead of the UK as well, I have to say. But I think the underlying point that um, Mr Lockhart makes is about what are the key areas to look at, and he's already mentioned uh, one of them, which is productivity. That's got to be a key issue for us. And within productivity, he can imagine that we will be looking very closely, not least through the fact it's in the title uh, for uh, Paul Wheelhouse's job at innovation um, and how we can, uh, we've mentioned Scotland can do already, but how we can increase innovation, um, how we can increase um, entrepreneurial take up. That's the point of much of what we're doing just now. I think he mentioned as well exports and the level of exports to the rest of the UK and to Europe. Going out with the UK, that is where I think we have got some uh, serious ground to make up. What can we do to make the culture much more, especially in our small and medium-sized uh, businesses, uh, export-orientated? What is, what is the obstacle to that? Is it a cultural one? Uh, are there regulatory ones? Um, and getting to the bottom of that. Now, I'm not saying I'm the first person to look at that, uh, and it's, I'm not saying it's an easy thing to resolve. But I think in terms of trying to boost economic performance, Increasing that investment that we get into Scotland, the point that was made previously by Ash Denham in relation to R&D is very important as well. It's a feature of very strong economies. Uh, and, and whether it's the um, nature of the UK economy, the kind of lopsided approach that we have with London sucking up much of the investment from the rest of England, far less the rest of the UK, whether that's been a factor. But we do have to improve our productivity. We have seen improvements around 4.4%, I think, since two, 2007, which is higher than the UK, um, substantially higher than the UK, but not nearly as much as we have to do. Uh, so changing the culture in terms of innovation, changing the pattern um, or the, the hit rate in terms of exports for a small and medium-sized enterprise, it tends to be the same companies which continue to export and they grow the exports. Let's try and get many more of our companies exporting as well. And that is partly uh, the reason why the review of the skills agencies and that that's the other uh, leg of what um, I think uh, Dean Lockhart was saying, the skills that we have to have not just the skills that we need right now in the economy, the ones that we can see we're going to need very shortly. So trying to anticipate those as best we can and make sure they're there to give us that edge. So I think there are different aspects that that's just a, a really a highlight of the areas that we know that we're looking into. There will be others as well, but um, perhaps it would be useful, despite all that, to write back to Dean Lockhart with some of our uh, views on the relative e economic performance and a fuller answer on those different aspects. Thank you. Secretary. Minister. Thank you. Uh, convener, if I could maybe come in, I, I agree absolutely with everything that the Cabinet Secretary has said. Uh, just to pick up a specific example, though, we, we have, as we talk, touched on it, renewable energy, um, one of the fastest growing sectors that we have had in Scotland for, for some time. Uh, Counter-cyclical, uh, we've had investments throughout the, the recession in uh, uh, billions of pounds of investment in onshore wind uh, and increasingly in, uh, in areas such as off offshore wind, uh, which is providing employment opportunities for uh, at Nig Energy Park and then uh, in, in yards in, in Fife and elsewhere. So we are seeing some great opportunities arising from that. Now, um, that, that is a sector which is fully supported by the Scottish Government. I believe it has broad support across the, the Scottish Parliament and Civic, Civic Scotland, notwithstanding some of the local tensions about planning applications, which I fully acknowledge. Um, but here we have a sector which has, uh, has an industry desperate to invest in it, um, has uh, the uh, natural advantage in, the, in that we have uh, the, the energy resources here, which can be utilised to develop the sector, and external policy influences. And uh, I'm not meaning to mean a, uh, make a big constitutional point about this, but un unhelpful decisions that have been taken in respect of a uh, position on technology by, uh, by UK government uh, in recent times has, has choked off that. So we do need to reflect that, that this parliament can play a role in, in liaison with UK government as well and saying, look, this is unhelpful to the development of Scotland's economy. There is broad support for this sector. We have um, a great opportunity to invest. It is creating jobs around the country and um, policy which perhaps for understandable reasons, being uh, I, I don't uh, deny the democratic uh, right of the UK government to change policy in respect of uh, decisions in England and Wales, but it has had a detrimental effect on a growing industry in Scotland, which has been powering our economy through a very tough uh, recession. 
and, and so that is not helpful. Um, we could actually be doing far more in terms of developing that sector if we had a more conducive environment to support it at this moment in time. So that's just one example where we can perhaps work together to make a case uh, for a different approach to, uh, to support for the renewables industry. And to, that's just one example of perhaps other sectors that we could, we could take a lead on. Thank you. Um, Richard Leonard. The, um, uh, there's been mention made already of the, uh, the Manufacturing Action Plan which was launched in February of this year. And I just wondered whether uh, the Cabinet Secretary could update us on where we are with the various action points in it. I mean, for example, uh, has there been a decision taken on the location of a manufacturing centre for excellence? Uh, how extensive has the workplace innovation service uh, uh, been? Uh, the leadership development uh, programme, how extensive is that? Um, and the enhanced asset reviews by the Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service, which had a target, I think, of uh, 600 over three years, at uh, what point have we reached with them? First of all, the Manufacturing Action Plan has only recently been produced, so many of the questions which um, Richard Leonard has asked uh, have not been resolved, including the first of those in terms of, its, um, of the location for the Centre of Excellence. There are different... Um, different interest being taken into account uh, currently, but um, I, I would say that uh, beyond that, I think the Manufacturing Action Plan is very useful in its own right, but I think I'm just new to this position. I would like to see that extended further to make it a, something which used to be fashionable to be talked about, which is an industrial policy. So it's, it's all very well to have manufacturing. So uh, I think we've done a tremendous job in terms of um, uh, making sure we continue to make steel in Scotland. But we have to make sure beyond that what the steel is being produced for. We have to make sure that the raw materials coming into that. So I think it's the way those things hang together. So I'm happy to write back to Richard Leonard on the various points he makes on the manufacturing action plan. But I am new to this position and I want to take a, a wider view of that. And there are some things which we'll be able to be very public about shortly, which will demonstrate that we are taking a more holistic approach. Uh, manufacturing, I think, over the last 30 or 40 years has been almost like a dirty word, where it's seen people just seem to give up on the idea that we can be a significant manufacturer, and I'm not willing to accept that. And that's why, of course, uh, my predecessor uh, instigated uh, the Manufacturing Action Plan. But I do think it is now, and perhaps even more so in relation to events of the last three or four days, there may well be opportunities as to how we can flesh out industrial policy I don't know if any of the officials want to come in on that. On that. No, um, uh, that response, um, uh, which I'm very encouraged by, because this is a plan and not a strategy, and what we need is a strategy. Do you wish to make a response to that? Well, just to say that exactly that point that uh, Richard Leonard is making. There is, I think it's very good uh, to have... <laughs> Uh, a manufacturing action plan, but it has to sit within a wider um, context. And I think the industrial policy, maybe there's a new buzzword that we should be using for that these days, because it's so long since people talked about it. It's like the old alternative economic strategy, which used to be talked about as well. Um, but I do think it is very important that it, it hangs together. Uh, and so what you'll see, I think, in the review that we're doing of Scottish Enterprise and the other bodies is fleshing that out as well over the course of the summer as to how that helps it hang together. It, it's, and perhaps that's been one of the weaknesses that we've had previously, that we've thought too much in isolation about different manufacturing opportunities. And it doesn't stack up unless you've got the basis. You've got the supply that's coming in for uh, manufacturing and you've got uh, beyond that downstream also the right way to access the markets for what you manufacture. Now, I think um, there are real opportunities in relation to that. As I say, I'm new to the position. I'm happy to flesh that out more in detail over the weeks and months ahead uh, and write to Richard Leonard on some of the specific points that he's raised as well. Thank you. Um, before I ask Gillian Martin to put her question, there's one matter I wanted just to clarify with the Minister, conscious that he'll be leaving us at 12. Um, I think energy efficiency falls within your portfolio, but the question is whether or not fuel poverty also comes within that portfolio. Well, um, the first thing I would say is that um, the government is trying to set out on its path uh, to be less silo driven and so we're working together with ministers across government on all these themes but you know clearly um responsibility is uh, for energy efficiency is one of the scottish parliament has uh, fully devolved uh, responsibilities now and um, we will be taking forward that as part of the development of the energy strategy so the energy strategy which will uh, consult with other colleagues um, in terms of housing and other areas 
uh, we'll be developing a whole systems approach. So it'll be looking at not just the supply of, of electricity, which tends to be where people focus on areas like renewables and other technologies, uh, nuclear, etc., but looking at um, how we actually use our energy, not just electricity, but heat, uh, fuel for, for transport, and certainly fuel poverty um, is an issue that cuts across all of these areas. So uh, whatever energy strategy we develop um, with colleagues will be one which uh, takes forward at its heart uh, delivery on our climate change strategy, but also tackling our, our statutory obligations in terms of tackling fuel poverty. And, and so that will be uh, a good example, I think, of, of, of cross uh, cross-portfolio working. Uh, clearly, it will also feature in the discussions around climate change strategy as well um, in, in relation to work of the Cabinet Subcommittee that will be led by Rosanna Cunningham. So I would imagine that fuel poverty will be cross-portfolio in practice um, in, in that respect. Um, uh, but it does uh, fall, fuel poverty does fall within uh, in, in, in the portfolio interests that I have. And uh, we are uh, obviously engaging with UK government on energy market uh, uh, regulation as well to see how that influences um, the ability to, to deal with fuel poverty. But maybe the, the question is who will take responsibility for that, and that may cover a number of issues. And I take it the well, if I could Clark's just clarify that, right I mean, the, the um, Angel Constance uh, colleague, um, Cabinet Secretary for Community, Social Security and Equalities, um, has uh, fuel poverty in her responsibilities. But I'm just making the point that um, we will be working very closely together. Uh, clearly, fuel poverty is something that's very relevant to the energy portfolio and delivery of energy supply, uh, but also the strategy, which will look about how we can help consumers to uh, to save energy and to therefore improve uh, their, their family finances as well. Right, thank you. Um, Gillian Martin. Uh, I've been asked to disclose, and I'm happy to do so, that I'm at the Parliamentary Liaison Officer for the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I was going to ask about the loan guarantees. Um, you've actually, but I suspect you won't be able to give me the answer. You're having meetings this in the next coming weeks about this. So since you probably don't have an answer as to where we are with that, with the Westminster government, I, I think it's important that maybe it, we get you to explain why they're so important to the businesses in the North East and the, uh, the oil industry in terms of innovation and keeping skills in the area. So if we can have a... Yeah, happy to do that, and uh, perhaps um, the Energy Minister would want to say a couple of words on this as well, if he's still here. Uh, in fact, do you want to go? Uh, I'm happy I to. Really have to. Uh, with, with your apologies, convener, I believe I may have to leave during the course of the Minister's answer. Well, just to say that uh, what we certainly heard from the industry when um, Paul Wheelis and myself went to visit them was that, especially for those that are not the big companies like BP and Shell and so on, was this uh, requirement to have loan guarantees, especially for infrastructure works. Uh, and in particular, there's an issue with um, if you have some people withdrawing from certain fields, uh, that then makes the costs of the infrastructure fall on fewer um, businesses. And it becomes a question of whether ahead of when they would naturally come to the end of their useful life, they are then, if not decommissioned, they're no longer used because nobody's able to pay for them. Uh, and the same is true for investment in further infrastructure um, to support um, uh, production or even in terms of supporting exploration. So we had a very clear uh, request. I have to say the companies, by and large, were grateful for what the other measures that the UK government took in its budget. They were, you know, they'd been lobbying for those and they had got some of those. Obviously, there's other things they'd want, but they were pleased about that. The one they thought they had made progress with uh, was loan guarantees. And apart from a mention in the budget, nothing further has been done about it. Now, I don't think there's actually a great deal of uh, difference in views between ourselves, the industry, and the UK government. What there is, I think, is a lack of appreciation on the part of the UK government about the need for pace in this. Things will start to happen very quickly if they don't have the investment which is required. And in order to make that investment, some of these companies need to have those loan guarantees. It happens in a number of other sectors. It's not something that's unusual. So I, th I suppose our plea uh, to the UK government is, we know you're sympathetic to this, get on and do it. Because if you don't, the implications can be very substantial. Uh, and also, the other thing I should just maybe mention that they said to us, they felt, despite the fact they felt it had a good hearing in terms of the budget's proposals in other areas on petroleum revenue tax and so on, uh, they felt that the industry was not being taken as seriously as it might. And they felt that was because, this is what they were saying, uh, they're not paying petroleum revenue tax, that there is no tax going in. And the UK government was saying, well, this is not a, an industry that's paying tax. Now, the point is, of course, over £600 million has been generated from the supply side of that industry as well. Those people are paying tax. Those companies are paying corporation tax. So there is a huge tax receipt from the North Sea uh, industries just now. And I think 
it's on that basis that the companies are very keen, the UK government, there's no point in taking, they said to us, uh, if they take three years over this, there's no point to it. It's got to be three weeks, three months, they, they get this sorted out. So that's, that's the nature of why, uh, what the loan guarantees they're seeking are and why they need to have them very quickly. Um, just yes, briefly, sir. just want to uh, annoy my private private office in doing so by uh, not leaving promptly. But um, the, uh, the I think one of the things that came across to, to me, and the camera secretary is absolutely right about the urgency of this, is also that we have, in, uh, as many people will observe if they're going around in Scotland's coasts, uh, explore, exploration rigs and other equipment which is sitting, um, sitting idle at the moment. And uh, the utilisation rates for that equipment are, are far lower than they usually are. Now, notwithstanding, I appreciate there will be difference of opinion about the development of, of, of um, more hydrocarbon fuels. Um, uh, but uh, it's just a, a, a technical point that those, those rigs um, will cost a lot more to bring back into use if they're lying idle for a long period of time. They physically need to be uh, taken from a cold start, um, as it's described to us, and brought back into uh, serviceable condition. They are literally rusting um, in, in the uh, sea locks and, and firths of Scotland at this moment in time when they're not being used. So there is an incentive on the part of the industry to ensure that UK government realises that there's a need to, to ensure that uh, through loan guarantees and other mechanisms that these assets can be maintained um, to try and support the industry to maintain them so that they, they don't have wasteful expenditure at some point later down the line to bring fuels back into use or to, to explore new fuels, um, because that is a disincentive for the smaller operators um, who haven't got huge balance sheets behind them to, uh, to invest um, in that they're very high costs. It may take £10 million plus to bring a, a rig back into serviceable condition, and that's a high, high cost uh, for a business to, to face, especially if there's no financial support for them. But may I ask on that, uh, with the lower oil prices, is it not better that uh, infrastructure for oil platforms and these sorts of things is retained in Scotland rather than being uh, dismantled so that it can be put back to use as and when uh, the oil price improves? I, I don't think it's uh, decommissioning that they're referring to here. It's, it's, it's actually um, uh, rigs which are ideally to be used in Scottish waters for Scottish fields, uh, but they are um, deteriorating. They will be um, deteriorating while they're sitting idle. Uh, there are different uh, maintenance schedules that can be applied, some which keep them effectively kind of oven ready, ready to go, uh, but there isn't incentive to do that at the moment with the lack of uh, investment coming through in the pipeline. Uh, and so the, the costs uh, are higher because they're effectively starting from a cold start position and that's a higher uh, financial burden on the part of the operator to bring that, uh, that rig back into, because they have to pay for that, not the rig owner. Um, they have to pay that cost to bring it back into use. So it's just to flag that up as an issue. And obviously loan guarantees and others may, may help bring production uh, and exploration activity back into, into play, which would allow that, those assets to be maintained uh, on a more regular basis. Julian Martin, any follow-up questions for the Cabinet <laughs> Secretary or the Minister whilst he's still here? Well, just really um, uh, a request that we find out as soon as possible what the results of your negotiations are on this, because obviously I'm, um, being a North East MSP, I'm getting quite a lot of, uh, of the industry representatives contacting me about this very pressing this issue. Yeah. Can I just say I've, I've written to the Chief Secretary of Treasury. I think it's next week that uh, I meet with him, and that's at the point which I'll take that up. And I'm happy to come back to uh, the committee with the, the outcome of that. Although I, suggest, I expect it will be myself making the case, him hopefully saying he'll look at it. But I'm happy to update the committee in due course. And um, did I think one of the officials want to contact? Was that just the point you're going to make? Was it the same point? The yeah, meeting on Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. Go to Greg Hans this week. Yeah. So that's a, a meeting on Thursday, you say. Thank you. And thank you, Minister. With apologies. Yeah. Yeah, thank Thursday. you. Thanks. It's a week on Thursday, isn't it? Right. John Mason. Hey, thanks, convener. And uh, there's just a few areas I'd like to kind of touch on, if that's okay, that haven't been mentioned uh, so far with the convener's indulgence. Uh, I mean, it's, the point's been made to us that housing is an important part of the economy now. Part of housing is just to give people decent houses, which is a separate question. But I just wondered if you see housing as, as an important part uh, of the economy as far as jobs and so on is concerned. Uh, yes, it's not part of my portfolio, obviously, but it is uh, extremely important, not just because people need to have warm, dry, safe, attractive places to live, but also because if you want to attract, coming back to my portfolio, uh, companies to locate in particular areas, housing supply, a good housing supply is very important for that. So, yes, housing is uh, very important to the economy, but in its own right as well. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, secondly, the enterprise agencies, I understand there's a review going on, Scottish Enterprise and HIE, I'm less familiar with HIE, but I think historically they've had slightly different remits. Now, if I'm correct, Scottish Enterprise falls under your remit, but HIE doesn't. Can you explain maybe why that's the case and how you see the review going? Yeah, I think it's the case because if you look at the remit of Fergus Ewing, which is about rural um, uh, issues and connectivity and so on, there's a natural um, uh, alliance, if you like, with uh, HIE in relation to that. But we do have a fairly close working relationship into, uh, in relation to working across that. So there will be issues which I'm dealing with in terms of the economy, which will impact on rural areas, and we'll have joint working in relation to that. Um, I think your other point was about the review itself uh, and how that's going to work, am I right? Yes, yeah. uh -huh. and I mean, I mean, I think the point's also been made is, you know, given the ch new challenges we're facing after last week, uh, you know, is there is the review the priority for Scottish Enterprise, and or should they be just out there doing their work kind of thing? No, no, no I think it uh, continues to be a huge priority. I think whilst we're doing that, of course, we have to keep an eye on the fact of, take one example, one of the bodies that will be involved in that re review will be SDI, and obviously this is, I think, the point was made by perhaps Jackie Bailey or, or somebody previously, a, a crucial point in terms of investment and the potential for disinvestment. So we have to make sure, of course, that their eye remains on the ball in relation to those things, but this, this review will proceed, uh, and I think will be informed by some of the things that we have to confront as a result of the Brexit, um, uh, the, the, the Brexit vote last week. So it will, it is a short period for us to achieve this, you know, by the end of the summer. Um, so uh, it's not going to be something that lingers for a long time, but it's extremely important. I think also, if you think of the time scale, not that anything seems certain in this environment, but one of the time scales we're told is that uh, Article 50 wouldn't be triggered until uh, October, perhaps after that. Uh, then there's a two year period after that. So this um, environment that we're in is going to continue for some time. And I think it's right that we continue and bash on with the review of the enterprise agencies, the Scottish Funding Council, Skills Development Scotland. Uh, in fact, you could actually say uh, if if this uh, vote had happened and we hadn't planned that review, we'd have to do some pretty quick work to make sure that we were pointing in the right direction to deal with some of the implications of the vote in any event. Okay. Now, I mean, another part of your remit is the fair work side of things. And I mean, it's always the fear, I think, that when we're ch facing challenges in the economy that, you know, we just want jobs almost at any cost. And, you know, does the fair work side like getting the living wage, like making sure women eh, are getting, you know, their fair shot of, of jobs, you know, would be kind of secondary. So how, how do you see them balancing up? It's a very good point. As you say, if things become pressured, then there can be the temptation to say jobs at any price. But the whole thrust of what the government is doing and what the First Minister has said is that we, first of all, believe that Scotland's voted to stay in the EU and we intend that Scotland should stay in the EU. Now, if you have that approach, then I don't think you can reasonably start to lower your standards in terms of fair work practices, um, many of which are underpinned by European legislation. I recently did uh, procurement, for example. Uh, and much of what we've done, although we can't, um, uh, we're not able to insist upon it under European regulations, is to drive up um, um, people being paid the living wage, for example. So I think it's entirely consistent with the government's approach of wanting to stay in Europe for the benefits that it brings, not least to employees, that we continue to maintain and improve those standards for employees as we go forward. Okay. And just the final point I wanted to ask about. Um, you know, quite often when we're discussing the economy and other factors, it, the comparison is always with the rest of the UK. I, I just wonder if you think sometimes we overemphasise that and maybe we should compare with, you know, say, Denmark, Netherlands, Ireland, other countries like that? I think it's a very good point, and I agree with it, although we, um, I think the point made previously by Dean Lockhart, how important the rest of the UK is to the, the market in Scotland, we can't lose sight of that, but you're right, and if you look at the performance of Scotland in relation to small uh, European countries, it's, you know, 1.9% growth, it's about there or thereabouts with other European countries. Um, however, you don't want to set that as your ceiling. You want to achieve the highest possible um, uh, performance that you can. And it's perhaps inevitable that people will, given the fact that um, hitherto we've been part of the UK, people want to make that comparison. And also much of our ONS and other um, statistical gathering mechanisms are based uh, around that. They come out in the context of the UK, so that's perhaps inevitable. But if what you're saying is we should be much more willing and keen to compare ourselves with comparable um, nations and economies around the world, I mean, that evidence is out there already, and perhaps we should be doing a bit more of that. It gives you a more objective um, context in which to judge the Scottish economy's performance. Thank you. Um, 
Cabinet Secretary, you commented on staying in the European Union. Of course, we are part of Europe, whether we're in the European Union or not, as a, as a matter of geographical and historical fact. Um, but surely it is the responsibility of the United Kingdom Parliament to deal with issues of our relationship with the European Union and international relations, and indeed your own position, or indeed any every member of this committee or the Scottish Parliament, um, exists in terms of the Scotland Act 1998, which sets out in Schedule 5, Part 1, Paragraph 7, that issues to do with international relations are reserved to the United Kingdom Parliament. Would you like to clarify your position? Yes, I think uh, having been a member of this Parliament, not as long as some, but uh, certainly for the last <laughs> last nine years, um, it's always been the case that this Parliament has been an outward-looking Parliament which has had international relations, whether it's through the External Relations Committee uh, or others. Uh, and it's also true to say that both the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government have very extensive discussions with uh, the institutions of the EU on a regular basis. And that is not going to change, and I think it will expand because of the vote that we've just had. Uh, the UK government does have these responsibilities. The Scottish government, I believe, has the responsibility to reflect the fact that 62% of people in Scotland that voted voted to stay in the EU. That's a responsibility that we take very seriously and we'll intend to prosecute. Obviously, the Parliament's going to have uh, discussions on that later today, but I think it's uh, absolutely the responsibility of the Scottish government to have regard to what the Scottish people have said. Jackie Bailey wanted to come in on a point. Um, just briefly, can I also state for the record, I may have been here for a long time, but I did start very, very young. Um, <laughs> can, I, can I return to the question of the review? Um, because I, I do think this is important. We support the review. We agree with it. I would encourage the Cabinet Secretary to reflect on the timetable, though, because I think we're all aware of you know, organisational change in and of itself um, isn't necessarily the most important thing. Um, and when you have organisational change, sometimes there's a degree of navel-gazing and protectionism that diverts them from you know, the main purpose. And given what we know about the potential impact of the EU referendum, he would not find criticism from many people um, if he chose to extend the timetable slightly. So I invite him to, to consider that. This is a very fair point. And, uh we will obviously consider those points. What I would say is it tends to be the case, notwithstanding recent events, that if you set uh, a certain amount of time for something, you take up that time regardless. Uh, and one thing that I'm loath to do is set aside more time because we'll just use up that time inevitably. However, um, I think the point that uh, Jackie Bailey makes about um, institutions, and I forget how she phrased it, kind of defending their corner, essentially. I think if you spoke to the officials that I've spoken to since I've been given this remit, they will know that's not how I intend to conduct this review. For example, we'll be able to say much more on this in the next week or so, but this is about how, finding out how the users of these services, those that benefit from these services, it's going to be central to the way that we carry out the review, much less to do with, we are this institution, we've done a great job, and leave us alone. That's not going to be the basis of it. Um, so I, I hope that what we announce in the next couple of weeks and people involved in the process will get to know about that in the next couple of weeks, perhaps even the next week, will help to reassure Jackie on Jackie Bailey on that point. I'm very grateful to her offer, uh, her offer of uh, no criticism for an extension to the review, and I'll certainly bear that in mind. Bill Patterson. Talk about age when it comes to you then, eh? <laughs> 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 hey, Minister, it's a, a couple of questions, related questions in regards to fracking. And I wonder if you could tell the committee when are the powers that have been promised uh, in relation to fracking going to be uh, uh, come to this parliament? And when they do, will it, will it will the final say, will the veto rest with ministers or will it be at local government level? I think uh, on the latter point, that's always been our view that it should be a ministerial um, decision in relation to that. As to the exact timescales, perhaps I can get uh, one of the officials to come back on that. This is when you really miss the fact that the energy minister's gone just now. Um, I I'm happy to give a timetable for how we intend to deal with it, but um, uh, the licensing, some of the licensing powers have already come to Scotland, uh, obviously, and uh, I don't think that one of the issues which is uh, material is when other powers come to us. We're carrying on with the review that we've got, the evidence-based um, review that we have, and the moratorium will continue through that period as well. So I don't think um, it's, it's the waiting for additional powers that's material to this, but uh, perhaps 
uh, Andy Hogg would want to say something more on that. Um, yeah, the research uh, projects to inform the consultation are currently underway and um, they'll hopefully report back towards the end of summer to allow consultation to take place going beyond that. Yeah. Thank you. Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Convener. A very brief question for the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, to help the committee focus on our uh, remit and work during the recess, um, is there any prospect of any changes or tweaks to the government's economic policy, the 4i economic policy, either in light of the EU vote or otherwise, or do you see that being the, the benchmark for the government's economic policy going forward? Um, it's a very good question. I think it's hard to see how any of those uh, four eyes which underpin the policy would cease to become relevant. Um, but I think you do make a very important point about how circumstances have changed. Uh, and of course we are in the process of looking at how those changed circumstances should impact on how we drive uh, economic policy. And perhaps just to come back to a point I made previously, and this is meant genuinely, if you feel there are issues which could be taken on by the government in relation to that, and that's true of uh, any members, then uh, we're more than happy to, um, uh, to listen to that. I think the, the underlying point is we are in pretty new territory here, um, and there's no way that somebody can have a 360-degree appreciation of all the different opportunities or threats. Um, so the more people that are looking at that with Scotland's interest at heart, uh, the better, and more than willing to listen to that. We don't propose Apart from reviewing what we're doing, obviously, in the light of circumstances, changes to that, I cannot see a circumstance where the, the four eyes wouldn't be just as applicable. But if there are other um, uh, suggestions or other things occur, then, of course, we will look to incorporate that. Thank you. Are there any other points anyone would like to raise with the Cabinet Secretary? If there's nothing, I would just like to thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for coming today and for responding and also setting out your own position at the outset. Thank you very much. Thank you. A few housekeeping matters. I should have said at the outset that, of course, although Gordon MacDonald is not here, he has sent in his apologies. So these, these are noted. And the next point was to ask the committee to agree that items three and four on the agenda be dealt with in private. Is that agreed? Yes. Thank you. We will then move over to private meeting. After we have a short uh, break.